Um, thank you and uh, welcome uh, to those of you who are joining us this afternoon for this Oakley Colloquium via Zoom um, with Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Ian Urbina, with whom I will speak in just a moment. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jacqueline Hidalgo. I'm the director of the Oakley Center for the Humanities and Social Sciences and a professor of Latina and Latino studies and of religion at Williams College. For those of you interested in Oakley events, next week on October 6th, we will be back in person at the center to speak with Merve Emre, who will be in conversation with my predecessor, Gage McWeeny. But for today, by way of welcome, I have a round of thank yous to issue first. Even though this conversation is virtual, it exists because of Williams College, and it is with gratitude and humility that we acknowledge that we at Williams are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, the people of the waters that are never still, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship and being forced from here today, their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. This history is recent, it shapes our present day. All artistic and intellectual endeavors that happen here at the college, such as the conversation we will hold this afternoon, are indebted to the Stockbridge Muncie community, their ancestors, and these lands. To them, we pay our deep respects. Although we cannot change the past, we pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. It is in the spirit of gratitude for this opportunity to hold conversations about justice in global terms that I also offer my thanks to Ashok Rai for sending me ideas for colloquia like these. Please know that all faculty and staff at Williams are welcome to send me suggestions and there's now a Google form for that on the website. Um, and every week, I also offer my sincere and enduring gratitude to our associate director, Krista Andrews, who just always finds a way to make everything happen. And tonight she is managing the Zoom space. For those of you familiar with the Oakley format, it is designed to open up space for more informal conversation than a normal lecture. To that end, I will introduce our guest of honor, ask him to provide some context for this award-winning report on the secret of prisons that keep migrants out of Europe, and then open the floor to questions. You're welcome to raise your Zoom hand or post your question to the chat at any point, and Krista and I will do our best to facilitate conversation. Please know that this conversation, unlike most Oakley conversations, is actually being recorded. So you are welcome to make the choice that works best for you in terms of your video preferences. This afternoon, we are especially excited to welcome Ian Urbina, the director of the Outlaw Ocean Project, a nonprofit journalism organization based in Washington, D.C., that focuses on environmental and human rights concerns at, at sea globally. He's an investigative reporter whose current work chronicles the diversity of crimes offshore, including the killing of stowaways, sea slavery, intentional dumping, illegal fishing, the stealing of ships, gun running, stranding of crews, and murder with impunity. He's reported from Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, and the Middle East, much of that time spent on fishing ships. Thank you so much, Ian, for joining us today virtually. Um, as we know, after leaving behind your dissertation in anthropology and history, you've spent years as an investigative journalist. And as you described, you started this non nonprofit, the Outlaw Ocean Project, in order to report on human rights and environmental issues at sea. It's an innovative multimedia site, now with its own podcast, too. Um, at the Oakley, we like to start by offering our guests an opportunity to provide us context, to give us a sense of key takeaways um, in the work that you did, but also of things that you didn't get to put up on the website that you think it would help us to know about. So I have a couple of opening questions that to start the conversation, and, and some of it's just very simple, like what would you like to share that might help us understand the context of this piece better? But I think it would also help us to hear from you. How did your work as an investigative journalist lead to the Outlaw Ocean Project? And then how did that work turn you to this story? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, second of all, I feel like I should, um, you know, start with a confessional, which is, um, you know, I used to be part of your tribe and I was, I'm ABD and um, sort of put on the iceberg out. Um, uh, so it's nice to be back in the company of academics. Um, so yeah, so I will get to your question, Jackie, um, but first take maybe four steps back uh, um, and I'm gonna start a clock on me to make sure I don't talk more than 
independence. Um, so uh, I was an investigative reporter at the New York Times. Um, for much of that time, I was um, on the investigative team, but uh, I started as a beat reporter and sort of worked my way up through the ranks. Um, and the last series I did at the New York Times was, uh, or the second to last, was called The Owl Ocean. Uh, and it was two years spent with um, a couple of methodological ambitions. One was, um, you know, let's take the, the reading public out to this watery two thirds. Let's approach that realm, not as an environmental story, but a human story. Um, let's conceive of it as a frontier and really um, try to tell stories that are at the intersection of environmental and human um, woes, if you will. Um, and let's not do what historically has largely been done with stories about the ocean or from or you know aimed at the ocean. Let's um, not do the reporting on shore. Let's actually get out in the space. Um, so and ultimately, the more I reported, the more I had the added ambition of sort of broadening the taxonomy so that you know, if I turned to my mom, as I did, you know, six months in and said, I'm working on maritime crime type stuff. And she said, oh, so you know, Somali piracy or BP spill or plastic pollution, all legitimate true topics, but a very narrow uh, understanding of um, the cast of characters and the kinds of um, uh, concerns out there. Um, so that ambition, uh, an investigative narrative rendering, explanatory rendering of this frontier um, was one that traveled from the original series in the newspaper into two more years spent on it at sea or, um, for the book. And then after that, the desire to maybe stick with it and step outside of the gray ladies universe and create a sort of ProPublica style NGO that does um, journalism in a different way. Um, so that's, that was, that's kind of what got me to where we are now. And where we are now is a staff of eight um, uh, largely philanthropically funded uh, by many of the same people, um, at ProPublica and the Marshall Project, and a bunch of X Times folks. You know, kind of both of those entities. Bill Keller, who runs Marshall Project, was who hired me at the New York Times when he was executive editor. Uh, ProPublica, you know, was founded by the folks who founded the Investigative Cluster at the Times, and um, so it, um, it's sort of in that tradition. Um, and I think it's also also where journalism is heading, but. Um, and um, uh, but the other things I wanted to do that are and were very distinct was I wanted to innovate in how we distribute the stories. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the reporting of stories and the presentation of stories, but the, the dissemination of them to me is woefully lacking in in uh, daring and creativity and and innovation and I wanted to do that and I knew I couldn't do that at the times. And so melding journalism with art, music, murals, animation, stage performance, um, uh, you know, having a more direct relationship with uh, stakeholders in the world, lawmakers, lit, um, uh, lawyers, uh, advocates, without crossing the firewall between advocacy and journalism, but getting much closer to the fence and talking across the fence to them, metaphorically. At the times, you had to say 20 feet back. Um, uh, I didn't really see that as um, appropriate, you know. Um, uh, and if you want to have social impact with the journalism, then you probably got to get closer to the fence. Um, and then um, also blowing up something fundamental to what I think is debilitating about journalism as it's practiced traditionally which is uh, intellectual, you know, sort of copyright and exclusivity. So taking stories, whether it's at the New York Times and one huge investigation, spend a year on it, put it in the paper and only New York Times reader, readers read it in English, you know, and if you really are trying to get huge impact, I think you've got to like aim at young people, you've got to aim at non-English, you've got to get the stuff run in the very places in the world that's mo that are most impacted, et cetera. And that means you're going to have to do a lot more than just running it in the New York or the New York Times or what have you. And so I thought um, that's another thing that we want to do differently. Um, so the investigative core and the desire to do long form written as the sort of fundamental starting point 
is still how we operate. Um, everything, you know, we, we choose one or two big topics a year and we try not to be, we don't even aspire to be first, we aspire to be best. So even the migrant crisis on the Mediterranean had been done quite well a lot, but we thought, okay, is there a new way that we can do it that will help explain it uh, deeper and um, more effectively? And we spent a lot of time thinking about l literally, you know, reading hundreds and hundreds of already existing reporting on it and seeing what are some structural things that are embedded, the assumptions in how the whole trope is framed that might, that maybe we could step to the side of and problematize. And one of them in this case was there's this sleight of hand, rhetorical sleight of hand that um, I found to be very problematic and common in how key EU players were responding to criticism about the EU or more specifically the Spanish, Greek, Maltese and Italian roles um, in these abuses. And it was typically like, it came in the form of, hey, we know stuff in Libya is bad. Um, horrific stuff is happening in the detention centers, but that's not our fault. We're just funding the guys on the water and we're trying to do so because we're trying to rescue them we're rescuing them from drowning and we're rescuing them from traffickers. Okay, not entirely untrue, but largely untrue. What they're actually doing is funding an on the water force whose true effect, even if it's not their mission, is to turn huge numbers of folks and send them back to a place that is, everyone agrees, a war zone and not a safe haven. And very horrific things are happening there. And so if you were to confront a bank robber and his sidekick and the sidekick waited in the car and you were to say, hey, look, we're bringing you up on charges too. You drove the car and didn't go in, but you knew what was going on. So we're going to prosecute you as well. The court wouldn't say, oh, well, you know, you're just driving the car and you know that bank robber is happening inside. But so similarly, if the EU or in this case, quite especially Italy, is very knowingly funding a player that's engaging but one step removed in a crime, then it's fair for the public to really call them on that. And and so I thought, let's try to figure out how we can do that because this is this keeps happening in every story that's running. And ultimately it's and so what we came up with for better or for worse was this notion of metaphorically and let me be very clear metaphorically there is a war on migration that war has an air force it's called frontex they're putting drones and planes in the sky that are 24 7 patrolling the mediterranean their purpose is to call in the coordinates of migrants crossing those coordinates are called in to key figures who then call the libyans and the libyans go and grab them that's your, so the Air Force is Frontex. The Navy is the Libyan Coast Guard, right? An Air Corps, it's not a true Coast Guard, but a proxy militia, okay? And their job is to nab those people and bring them back to Libya. And then the Army are the boots on the ground in Libya that are running the militias, that are running the detention centers. The war consists of those three armed forces, and it's being funded to a large degree in different levels in each silo. But we need to stop talking about it as if, well, you're only responsible for the one silo that's the Navy. No, you're responsible for what the Frontex is doing and you're also indirectly and directly responsible for what the Army is doing on land. And so our big thought was, let's um, push back this siloing manipulative maneuver and let's say, no, no, we're not gonna play ball with how you're framing things. We're gonna frame it in a different way. And now how do we do that? Well, don't write an article, write a story make it narrative, have a character, forward motion, report the hell out of it. So that means put one team on the water and one team on land. So we put Ed, who, who's, who's a videographer, on a five-week embed on Doctors Without Bordership on the water and had him con control that front. And then I took a team to Libya to do the on-the-ground reporting. And the goal there was we chose Ali Ukande because he was a compelling story, a fresh character um, at one of the most notoriously impenetrable, largest, brutal detention holding centers um, who was dead upon our arrival. Um, and 
basically said, let's tell Aliyu's story. And we got lucky. We didn't know his name when we flew in. We, you know, had to figure out his name, find people that knew him, find the eyewitnesses that saw his killing, and then back build his life in reverse all the way back to Guinea-Bissau by reporting all the way back to his home village. Um, and then piece it all together and then make his journey synecdoche for the larger migrant story. Um, and it worked, you know, I mean, it, it came at considerable cost and we got banged up pretty good um, in reporting it. But ultimately we came out with, I think, uh, a method of explaining um, a bigger picture on how these different forces are um, wittingly or unwittingly collaborating, coalescing around a pretty horrific thing. Um, and then if you want to go even more meta, and then I'll shut up because I think I'm at time. Um, I think like the story that you have here, it's not a stretch to say what's happening, the outsourcing of the policing of migration that the EU generally or Italy in particular are engaged in um, is the same story as what the US is doing in Mexico. We are outsourced, we are trying to move our border further into a domain that's out of the reach of journalists and academics and lawyers and into a realm where, you know, laws are, you know, murky. Do they have to apply? Do they have to treat the people the way that we would treat them? Probably not. It's in Mexico. Are you funding the facility where they're being held? Yes. Are you complicit with what happens to them? Okay. You know, now it gets complicated, right? So I think like the notion that's even above the Libya story is the notion that Climate migration is not going to lessen. Major wealthy Western nations are dealing with the US on the southern border, Europe on its border, Mediterranean in a outsourcing sort of way. That's a completely unviable and inhumane and potentially illegal method of dealing with it. And here's one story to show just how. Uh, so that, that was our goal in this reporting. I'll stop there. Thank you for that. Um, I will. I'm I'm happy to open the floor to questions, but I have a a, a lot of a lot of different questions my myself. Um, you know, maybe just uh, one that I'm I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about coming from where I am is I, I appreciated your uh, linking what the EU is doing to what the US is doing um, in the context of Mexico and a number of times, both in uh, how you're talking about the 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 sea overall and the work of the Outlaw Ocean Project, and here you've been using the notion of a frontier, and I just love to understand a little bit more about how you understand the frontier, what sort of is a frontier, and how is it working? I mean, for me, the frontier that is the Outlaw Ocean. Well, let me take a step back. So I don't by any you know. Everything is a nail to a hammer, right? Everything is a problem to an investigative journalist. Okay, so guilty as charged. Okay, but my mission, as I define it, is to look for things that are broken and to, in a fair, rigorous, careful way, shine light in an explanatory fashion so that others will do something about it, right? Um, so when I look at the, the high seas in particular, but the ocean realm, I do see the Nat Geo sense of awe, but I focus on the awful. Right. You know, I'm, I'm focusing on all that I think generally is not reported on out there. So there's a beautiful marine story of all sorts of beauty and, and kind of exploration and science. And, and I leave that to others to do. I focus largely on things that I don't think are covered, that are largely human driven and are deeply worrisome. Um, it's a front to me. The frontier is the notion that it's a liminal space. It's an edge or the mid zone between two realms. One, the, the, it is, it is um, from a governmental point of view, from a law enforcement point of view, a frontier in that um, to the extent that there are rules and laws out there, they're often murky, they're thin, and they're rarely enforced. There is no international set of cops on the high seas. They do not exist. So it's a weird realm in that sense. Um, it is one of the, the international public commons that belongs to everyone and no one. And that is a tragedy of the commons in the sense that historically it has not been 
um, well managed, to put it mildly. Um, so it's a frontier also in other ways, in my rendering. If you think of the high seas in particular through literature, through the intellectual history of the high seas, you, you probably should think of a place that has long been a metaphor of freedom. Um, I, in the book and just in my heart, think it's better described as a void. It's not freedom per se, it's just absence. And in absence, you have freedom, you have utopianism, you have dystopianism, you have heroism, you have um, horror, you've got anything you want. What you don't have, what I think is the defining feature is the standard expectations of governance, policing, and sort of um, civilized uh, norms, right? Um, so I think you've got a booming realm where more than 50 million people work. A lot of them are near shore, not high seas, but a lot of people work offshore, a, a good number of them in the high seas. Many of them are transient. I'm, if you think of the, the, the ocean realm bifurcated, maritime fishing, 2 million maritime, maris, you know, cargo ships, unionized typically, deep pockets, brand vulnerability, a whole different universe of work. Fishing, distant water fishing, especially, non-unionized, extremely insular, uh, pretty lawless, hyper-violent, um, lots of, uh, you know, it's like the 20th and 19th century, you know, different, different universes. Um, and so I focus on the fishing realm. And so transient people largely worked by developing world nations, many of them undocumented, many of them debt bonded or worse, um, doing a brutal form of work that's, you know, kind of Dickensian in its, you know, lack of OSHA standards, et cetera. Um, and so in all those ways, it's a, it's a liminal space in terms of time, like it's going back in time in terms of governance, it's at the edge of landed law. Um, uh, and also in terms of anthropology or culture, if you will, it's, it's, a, it's a liminal space in that, um, you know, the workplace that is a, that is a, a distant water fishing vessel, a Taiwanese tuna longliner. Um, the captain is not the boss he's god like he is uh, we just were working on this deep investigation we're doing on chinese distant water fishing fleet squid fleet and we scored in a, a beautiful document you academics can relate to which is a, a diary that was written by a chinese deckhand that entered the court record we're reading the diary and making myself very happy and he's got this line that the captain is emperor you know it's like oh my gosh i wrote that myself you know he just said it in his own terms um, so the hierarchy, the expectations, the, the, the mode of communication, the folklore, the language, the jokes, the superstitions, all the anthropological things that make culture are distinct out there. So for all those reasons, I think of it as a frontier. Uh, and that's, that's my metaphor I'm sticking with it. No, oh, thank you. That was interesting. Um, Ashok, you just... Uh, unmuted your video. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah. You're muted. Okay, unmute. Okay, great. Um, uh, hi, I, so this is a very depressing uh, story to read as, as many people probably told you. I, um, I'm just curious what, where, maybe you know already, or where do you think it leads to? Does there's this legal business of the refoulement. Uh, is there any prospect of a legal, uh, of people getting sued? There's also, it seems like there's this whole, the, the European Trust Fund seems like, under, is it, has it received more scrutiny? Do, do journalists elsewhere pick this up? Is, or do advocacy groups, um, I, I, I'm curious where it has gone or, mm -hmm. or, or where you hope it to go. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, so um, I think if we talk in categories, um, categories of impact, uh, um, uh, one is public messaging 
and the ambition there is to try to shove the narrative conceptually and to get more people, including lawmakers, but also journalists, to reject this silo maneuver, you know, that I mentioned originally, and to force a reckoning um, on the complicity that goes across these. Um, and we appeared before to EU Parliament hearings and had a bunch of closed door sort of Chatham House rules, um, uh, conversations with key lawmakers, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. What will come of that? Who knows? I don't have the bandwidth. I'm, we're a staff of eight. And, um, but, uh, but it seems like time well spent and we're, we were really proud of that. That's one category of impact. Um, in those conversations, to so the second category, there was interesting discussion and they asked me point blank, you know, what do I think should be done? And I said, I think you guys should, you know, take a look, hard look. You guys own, you know, run the purse strings. You, you can both sue and you can control the finances and who better than Frontex? Like you guys are funding Frontex. And if you want to tell Frontex to stop doing certain things, you guys have the power to do that. Um, uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is, you know, there are very wonky policy level things that you can also do, such as the redefinition in this murky way of the search and rescue zone, which went from the standard distance from the Libyan shore out because it was redefined and the International Maritime Organization approved it to 90 miles means concretely that when Doctors Without Borders or SOS Mediterranean or any of these true humanitarian organizations are trying to scoop up a migrant boat because their guys in the sky say there's one there. They're in a race against the Libyans. And the Libyans have the, le the playing field like this because they've allowed, they've gotten the, the search and rescue zone moved out to the 90 mile mark. So they have this weird rhetorical, legally bullshit, but rhetorical method of arguing over the radio and in our doc film, we have them doing it, that Doctors Without Borders is not allowed to be in those waters because those are Libyan waters, completely false. But the IMO gave a stamp of approval and they have this rhetoric. Well, the EU could push back the IMO and say, wait a minute, that's not legitimate um, in any sense. And it's causing lives to be lost because they have this huge slanted playing field. So that's that's a second thing. But concrete outcomes, these are suggestions, um, but concrete outcomes, Almabani was closed. Um, uh, whether that really means that much, it sounds great. My editors were happy, but it just means they're just moving them to one of the other 12 facilities. But it does show that it got some real recognition in Libya. We also know that um, uh, there was a lot of tumult, you know, from U.S. State Department and FBI who are still investigating our capture and abuse. Um, uh, that there are repercussions, sort of long tail repercussions on the relationship between the US government and the current Libyan um, uh, coalition government. Um, so, um, and how, whether journalists um, read it and were more inclined to do stories or less inclined or to think of them in different ways, I don't know. Um, yeah, that I, I have no sense of, but um, I do think that, uh, we, you know, tried our best to equip law firms, NGOs, um, and lawmakers with what they might need in terms of a strategy and a rhetoric and the documentation showing things that, again, before the piece, there was a brazenness with EU spokespeople claiming that they didn't fund things that we had documents that showed they did. And they, they walked that back a little bit. Um, you know, historically they were saying they didn't fund anything in the detention facilities themselves. Well, again, I have really good open source folks who spent months on end actually documenting from body bags to, you know, armored vehicles to all the things, the buses that transport them. So they could no longer claim that they can if, if other journalists don't, you know, hold their hand to the fire. So, um, you know, I think, I think those are all things that hopefully will come from it. We've since had to move on. We're coming back to this issue next year and we're looking at migrants, a different migrant flow. So Morocco in particular and Spain and that route uh, and West African migrants and certain ocean issues that are playing out differently in West Africa. Um, so we'll be back on it again, but right now we've put it down for a while. 
Thank you. Um, Michele, I saw that you posted something to chat. I don't know if you want to speak your question or want me to ask it. Sure, no problem. I can, I can ask it. Uh, I just wanted to go back to your uh, initial definition of frontier. And, and you know, while you were talking about frontier, I was thinking in terms of border. So I, I, I was wondering if you, if you can make like a sort of distinction between what is a Mediterranean frontier and, and, and a border one. Hmm. It's not a, I don't, I don't know the distinctions between the terms to even answer that in a smart way. So maybe go one step further for me. How would you define a border as different from a frontier? And then I can play with it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, in my head, I use them. I see it. I see the frontier as almost like a zone and a border as a line in my own simplistic mind. And so I always think of it and call it a frontier because it's a huge space. It's, it's not a line. The story on Libya, to some degree, was a story about the moving of the of the European border into Northern Africa, like the de facto play there that the U.S. is doing in Mexico and Guatemala and El Salvador. But that the EU is doing is they've through policies and through funding move the southern border of Europe into all the way down to, you know, Agadez in, in Niger, you know, and they're funding. So while they may not draw the line, they're helping rewrite laws and providing guys with guns and, and all, all the things that make it a de facto border. Um, they've moved that down so that people are stopped earlier in getting to the actual border, Lampedusa, right? You know, like, um, and, uh, but when I think about the outlaw ocean globally, I think of a frontier because it's all this space out on the water, whether it's South China Sea or the Arctic or wherever, where all sorts of extra legal things tend to happen. And that's what we report on. Magnus, I see you have a hand raised. Yes, uh, thank you so much, and thank you uh, for 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 your project and this incredibly important work that you're doing. And sort of related to the frontier questions, I'm interested in this the institution of Frontex, which is a relatively new institution, and they, they've grown by leaps and bounds, particularly since 2015. And and uh, I was wondering if you where you see this institution going, because it seems like the recent elections in Sweden and Italy might only sort of put even more emphasis uh, on, on, on their sort of operations and, and funding. It seems like they have a never ending supply of, of money to do, to do what they're doing. And then related, sort of slightly different question. I was, I've, I've been curious to know about sort of the, the middle people. Who are the agents who, who get the people onto these boats? Uh, how much is known about who they are and, and, uh, and, and sort of, uh, is this an ever-changing group of people who sort of facilitate this, this travel or, or is it sort of ever-changing uh, mm -hmm. landscape? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a Frontex expert. I became very fixated on their specific role um, in um, the aerial, you know, kind of the air force of the Mediterranean uh, front. Um, we delved in a little bit to internal unrest within Frontex, and we had a very good source who had who had recently left, and she was a um, a lawyer, and part of her job was to keep checks on Frontex, uh, and she left um, uh, quite concerned about these um, very issues. Um, my my sense is that. Um, the weaponization of migrants is, you know, around the time we were reporting this, the whole thing with the Russians, you know, kind of almost weaponizing migrants and sending them, my geography is terrible, but like sending them through the, on the other side and using them as pawns to apply pressure on Poland and others um, is kind of a new thing. Maybe it's not new, maybe it, maybe it is, but it's, it's certainly something that's cropping up and, um, and 
you know, you look at the, and I'm going randomly here, but you look at the history of Qaddafi, for example, and the, the ways in which he used migrants, not weaponized per se, but leveraged them, you know, threatening to turn Europe black if he didn't get the revenue to stop them as Europe had been paying him to do. Um, so this is not new, you know, using people in this fashion. Um, whether Frontex, and, and in fairness to Frontex, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that countries should, I mean, there are some folks out there who argue, and I've been in their midst before, and they argue that borders should be blown up, and they're, you know, I'm not completely convinced by the practicality of that, but um, but be that as it may, I think there are a lot of people that argue that countries have a responsibility, not just a right, to have some management of borders. And Frontex becomes the entity that's supposed to do this for this sprawling entity called the EU. Okay, so um, how do you avoid it becoming politicized so that um, it's being used in the ways that it is on the Mediterranean in clearly horrific, illegal, unhumanitarian ways? That's, I think, what we're fixated on. Um, it doesn't answer your question um, entirely, but I, I do think that, like you said, with the elections in Italy, I think that even on this, or especially on this very topic, on the Mediterranean and dealing with migrants, um, things are definitely going to get much more aggressive. Um, uh, the other question you asked, remind me, there was a second question. It was sort of about the interlocutors, about people who... The... Yeah. Um, so my impression, well, first of all, I think there's, if, if you really try to be an anthropologist of this topic and you try to not choose a term that a priori ass assumes things about those players then you probably don't want to call them traffickers in my head like you probably want to just think of them as people movers okay they may be bad they may be lifesavers for those who are desperately trying to get across and start a new life in europe like and if you start very neutrally about the role that those folks are playing in helping people get from one terrible place to a place that they want to get, then I personally think that's like a important starting point that rarely happens in journalism or even in academics. I'm thinking of the role that those play, people play is not always bad um, because they're trying to help people get away from harm. Um, uh, secondly, in now in Libya's case, um, uh, it's a very small sliver. Um, a lot of the people that are involved in that trade are the very people that are involved in the detention facilities. The militias have really, and you know, the federal government is consisting of the very same militias, have really consolidated the market over monetizing moving people and detaining them and extorting them and doing all these things. And they're often part of the same business operation. So in Libya, um, you do, if, if you launch from a certain place, um, the militia that controls that certain place is probably also the militia that has their cousin in DCIM, which is the division of the Libyan government that decides when the, so imagine Al Nawasi, right? That's the, that's the, the militia that took us. Okay. Nawasi controls and Rada is the other big one. Nawasi is headquartered in the port. Rada is headquartered in the airport. They're two of the biggest militias in, in Libya. We got taken by Nawasi. Nawasi has a bunch of folks that are their allies in the federal government who are in DCIM. They also have specific folks in the Coast Guard who are Nawasi loyal. And then they, they run a neighborhood um, where launches occur. So that's the Nawasi Corporation, right, if you will. So if you're launching from Libya and you launch in Nawasi territory, you're going to be on a Nawasi approved boat with a trafficker tied to Nawasi, sanctioned by Nawasi. You're probably going to then get picked up by a Nawasi associated Coast Guard vessel because the Coast Guard is not a federal entity. It's a bunch of individual. Then they're going to bring you back. So they're earning money on the front end. They're earning money on your capture. Then the guy at DCIM, when you're brought back to shore, you and 200 others, they call the feds. The feds say, send them to Mabani, send them to XYZ facility. And he's going to send that boat to his facility, his people's facility. 
So it's this circular economy where they're earning on the migrants at like several steps of the way, not even to mention what happened at the Niger border, you know, into the country. So it's, it's a serious business model and the traffickers are part of that business structure. And there are about like 10 different militias in different places, constantly fighting with each other, et cetera, and getting their guy in DCIM. And there's this whole, you know, complicated um, uh, landscape. Thank, thank you for that. I see that uh, Fee has a question. So I will yield the floor to Fee. Thank you so much, Jackie, and thank you, Ian, for this important work. So I'm really thinking here about and appreciating how you're bridging the bridging academia or the, the academic tribe, as you referred to it, and investigative journalism. So I have two questions that are really trying to get at how to continue to build bridges. The first is I'd like to pick up on part of your response to Magnus, and I'm interested primarily in how you bridge the logics of academia to investigative journalism. So being, being an anthropologist or a sociologist is often about meaning making, right? And so how did you move from primarily that to digging into actions, behaviors, building this composite 360 view of different actors? So put succinctly, are there some major tips or lessons you can impart about moving from primarily meaning making to more of a full storytelling. And hmm. then the second question related to that is, how would you like this work to be taken up or reflected back in the academy? Like, What would be the call to action for academics? How do we support this important work? Um, well, so, so I might duck or sidestep the meaning making framing to translate that into terms that are easier for me to use. And so in my um, simplistic outlook on the academy, if you will, the one of the main ways it's distinct from journalism, or at least in my experience, is rigor and time, you know, and also a little dash of theory, you know, like, um, so when I was at University of Chicago and I was doing this stuff, I loved the life of the mind, I love the rigor, I love the depth, I love the theory, um, I loved that you weren't hustling to quickly get it out. Um, I didn't love the, and this is just distinct to where I was, the sort of tendency towards obfuscation, sort of like taking something simple and making it hard to understand was almost a premium. And I, I liked how journalists said, if you can't explain it to a seventh grader, then you failed. I like that ethic much more. Um, but what I would say is the thing I tried to carry with me from my academic background was um, rigor, nuance, depth of reporting. And now if you're trying to turn out a story in 12 hours or one week, you simply can't, like you can't achieve that. But that's why I stepped out of the times and said like, let's do slow journalism and let's do it bet you know the quality version and let's go extremely like academically rigorous you know let's footnote let's do all these things so there are a bunch of things that even on this next china big two-year investigation that are very academic that we plan on doing um and not but like they really add value to the staying power of the journalism and the respect it gets from the likes of you you know um uh and that's like with China, we're, we've got a 500 page encyclopedia that's been all the reporting in a Q&A fashion in one place with every single thing because the New Yorker requires it footnoted. And normally you just leave that there and you publish this one dimensional story. And I said, why don't we try for a three dimensional story? So we'll run the 10,000 word story or 20,000 word story, but then to the 1% who's super interested, they can click any sentence and go to the next layer of depth, which shows you how do we do that? What's some side context on it? What's the sourcing on it? They can go really deep. Now, granted, that's a huge amount of time and expense and, and only one tenth of all readers will ever do that, but it's an important one tenth and it's a principle, et cetera. So I think like that's an example of something that had I not been in the academy, I don't think I would see the merit of it and of spending extra three months doing it. But I do now see it um, 
uh, because of it. Um, I would say that what I hope for as a relationship, sort of as a bridge builder between what I'm trying to do and what you folks do is, um, you know, I, I think there's a certain, um, I find that sometimes academics are concerned about losing credibility in the culture that is yours by stepping too far into the public space. And um, it's a small percentage who are willing to do that, but it can be risky. You can get blowback, you can get lots of things that are scary um, that I think journalists are a little bit more used to and academics are a little bit stepped back from. And um, I try to really encourage academics to come closer, you know, come to the fence. Yes, it's electrified, and but it's not gonna kill you. And where you belong is bringing what you know into the space. And if you can find journalists that you trust and you know, our job is to translate sometimes often what you do into terms that people can understand without your training, but that also don't lose the rigor and nuance that you guys have brought to it. And we're the intermediary. And, and I try to, in my space, bring more and more academics close to me so that I can have that transaction with them. Um, so that's the relationship I'm constantly working towards. Thank you for that. Fee echoes that in the chat. Um, Ashok, uh, actually, if you don't mind, I see that you have a, let's, let me pause for a second. And there's a long question from Jennifer McQuaid in the chat. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, if you want to say this out loud yourself, you've, you've unmuted your video so you can speak to it some and then, yeah. You're still muted. You're still muted. Oh, sorry. Your story got me thinking about the parallels between domestic violence and sex trafficking and other illegal violent human rights abuses of primarily women, but also men. Um, and I'm a clinical psychologist. And I thought of this parallel when you referred to the ringleader as the emperor, because the abusers in domestic violence and sex trafficking rings often have a similar power in like controlling information in and out of who's being abused and who's aware of the situation. And so it gave me hope when you talked about taking your findings to multiple stakeholders. And I wonder if you feel hopeful about that. Um, mm. I just wanna say that this question comes out of my experience working in New York City where they started funding family justice centers where in one place you would have policemen, lawyers, social workers, all providing support to survivors in an attempt to kind of like disentangle all the pieces. Mm. So mine's actually a very practical kind of question. Um, so mm. it kind of goes with what you just were talking about. Well, um, you've struck on an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I spent two years a long time ago uh, doing a series called Running the Shadows, which was about, it started out as a, a look at sex workers, but it, and then it was runaways. And then it was essentially like, a look at teens living on their own invisibly and you know the couch surfing and sex trade and LGBT, lgbtq you know predominance and, and obviously i did a lot of it in new york with uh, gems and polaris and a bunch of interesting yeah. organizations yeah. but then went all over the country working on it so um as goes frontiers and as goes invisible voiceless demographics and as goes like you say sort of the psychological bubble that often emerges whether you're on a ship or whether you're you know um a teen in a complicated relationship with someone who is selling you um uh i think you're quite right um there are parallels how i get from that over to your point about um speaking trying to speak to different stakeholders i can hop over there i don't know if it's a direct bullet bridge like i think my goal with these big projects, you know, with these topics we spent is to think of 
okay, we want to try to get, we're not engaged in stenography. Like we're, we're trying to do this so as to drive change, but without losing our membership as journalists. Okay. Mm -hmm. That means we got to abide by certain rules. Okay. But within that realm of rules, if we think very long game here, so for example, this big thing we're doing now on the Chinese distant water fishing fleet, we're looking specifically at the squid fleet, we're looking at all the standard issues, murder, and illegal fishing and slavery and et cetera, within this fleet. And we're thinking, okay, we've dumped two years on it, probably got another six months on it still. How do we make sure that's all worth it? Well, who are players and what are tools that exist out there? And if we start talking with them now about our findings without advising them on what they should do, without having them affect our input, our reporting, et cetera, we're keeping a state, a church state divide. Um, but how could we bring them in early, start talking with them? And then if they say, wow, this is really valuable, legitimate reporting. And now that you've come to us four months before you're going to publish, you know, we at this, the Human Trafficking Law Center in DC, for example, we've been talking with them for over a year now. They're planning on, and I probably shouldn't say this since this video is going to be published, um, but uh, they're planning on a top order request, you know, um, to the Customs and Border Patrol. That's a major legal process. They got to write a whole, you know, we open up our reporting to them, say, here's what we found. Here's the the contracts, here's the testimonies, here's the audio behind the testimonies, everything you need so you can see it, but you see it early enough that you can start working now. And that's a small adjustment that I couldn't do at the times. I wasn't allowed to do that. But now I'm my own boss and we, and I don't feel any journalistic violation in talking with certain people early. Um, and similarly, now take that same thing with, you know, Walmart or Congressman so and so or Interpol officer such and such, different types of stakeholders, and starting to talk with them early and say, look, you need to trust me that I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to repeat what you tell me. I need to trust you that everything I show you, you're not going to leak to the AP or someone else. If we trust each other, I want to like bring you into the know about what we're up to and and give you time to start figuring out what you want to do with it. Um, yeah. That's that's what we try to do. Yeah. No, I think that's interesting to think about how you have to be strategic because um, so often I think our understanding of these stories comes when people inside speak up, but in these isolated situations, no one's able to get the voice out. So you're really operating as the broadcaster of the experience. And so you have to, no, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Ashok, I know you had your hand up um, earlier, so I don't know if you wanted to have a follow-up question. I, I can I can jump in, but I don't want to hog the questions. Do you have, uh, I'll, I'll, or should I, I just say it very quickly. <laughs> um, uh, so, it, so Ian, it seems like there are two stories, two kind of little side stories or bits of that, that I just found really fascinating in this piece. One is, one is this business of aid agencies, you kind of allude to it, aid agencies that give stuff, but it's but it's like part of the part of the part of the part of the game for the people running the prisons or the it's it's stolen. Um, and this this aid dilemma, I just think that's a fascinating difficult issue I know you probably uh, won't investigate it but because you you this it isn't per se an ocean issue but 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 the other one that I that I thought of and you might totally disagree with I just wonder who gets called who gets to be called militia and who gets not to be called militia I mean mm -hmm. why isn't the Italian government being called a militia mm -hmm. that's my <laughs> I mean I'm if there's anyway that's mm -hmm. that but, but thank you for all the yeah. for all yeah. the all the all the all the thinking this is this is created yeah so aid diversion um is something that initially i thought would be a bigger part of the series of crimes that we were documenting i was wrong like i became very convinced that 
it's a minor fraction of the real crimes there. Um, and to some degree, to highlight it too much has real potential negative repercussions because the aid organizations are so worried about getting hit with that very thing that they're super controlled about what they're hand out because they just don't want the bad press. And it it rarely happens in any hugely consequential way. Um, meaning, yes, yeah, stuff gets stolen, blankets, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the real money making story, the thing that has life and death consequences for huge numbers of people isn't bottled water and blankets and diapers getting redirected and the resale or whatever repurpose of that stuff. It's like a much bigger story, which is like, these folks are used as forced labor. The women are actually allowed under Libyan law to be rented, you know, to a company or a guy or whatever, you know, um, the extortion model is like ubiquitous. It's not like a aberration. That's to me the bigger story. And that's why we really focused on that and not the aid diversion. And the real story in the aid organization's role, in my view, in Libya, is the complete lack of access that they have. You can hit IOM and you can hit Doctors Without Borders and you hit different folks. But at the end of the day, the big problem is that they do not, they're not allowed in. When they are allowed in, it's like 20 minutes notice. They're in complete controlled settings. They can't see, wait, who are the people over in cell block four? Like, why is this person bruised? Why don't you step back so they can tell me actually what's going on? They have zero of, and this week they can come, next week they can't. So they're very ineffective. And the, the real tragedy is that the aid organizations aren't raising a bigger stink about it because if they do, they'll lose what little access they have now. They'll be hit hard by the Italians or whomever, and then they'll get hit harder by the Libyans and they will not be allowed in at all. And at least they're getting in every two weeks so that they can gently exert power to say like, wait, there's a baby here. This is an unoccupied, you know, like they can do really acute sort of care. So now you're seven. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's the saying about religion and cult, you know, like, you know, there are a bunch of these versions which a smarter person could muster, but yeah, like um, I think, in Libya's case, calling the armed players something other than an army makes sense if you put the politics of it aside for a second, because there isn't actually a functioning government. There are two different governments, right? In Tripoli and Benghazi. And then even within both of those territories, you have a set of armed players that are vying for control and they're fighting with each other over it often in the streets um, but also in the offices etc and so because you have this fractured nature you know Mogadishu is the same Somalia is the same thing the federal government barely runs Mogadishu go to Puntland that is not part of Somalia I mean it's called Somalia but it's its own operating state and Somalia Mogadishu has no control whatsoever and so my only point is like these places have armed players that are rivals of each other and no recognized authority that's centralized. And that to me is the difference between an army and a militia because there are lots of them and they're contested. And this one's been kind of recognized as the official guys. And so Frontex is part of the government. It's recognized it gets federal dollars and people like take its authority seriously, you know, even though it's engaged in bad stuff, both guys are engaged in bad stuff, but, one is fractured and the other's not. So thank you for that. And and I actually appreciate um, you raising that question to show because it leads to a couple of like big questions I want to give to you, mindful that we're starting to run out of time, Ian, and so you can um, decide what what to do with them. But you know, for me, there there are so many different moving pieces that go into just this one amazing story, and then you have several of them on on the website. And and what you're trying to do behind the website is also to provide such um, 
to do something beyond what could be accomplished with just the New Yorker piece, right? Mm -hmm. And to provide a a bunch of different kind of ways into the story and ways out of the story. Um, You know, and so like, you've got the main story itself, but the, the sort of different background you give about locations, how you reported the different videos that are up there, the, the animations. Um, I, I was wondering if you might be able to share with us a little bit about, you know, both how you went about, you know, as, as you started the story and, and as you were working on it, how did you make decisions about what makes it into the New Yorker story? What goes on to different pieces of the website? What are the things that didn't make it anywhere that you kind of miss or or lament? Um, mm. And are there any things that you worried about putting up and putting out there? Mm. Um, so if you think of a body of reporting and the reporting has lots of different topics and is also in different mediums um, and you try to reduce it into the big clusters you had the original 10,000 word story and then you had an hour-long documentary film those are sort of the biggest things and um, the ancillary dots that you know orbiting moons around the 10,000 word megastar were these other pieces right op-ed on this and you know uh, explanatory on how do we do it on that and uh, side piece it's just going deep on front text on this and so you think of and then the doc film also has orbit uh, orbiting moons it's got like a five minute video here and a 20 minute video okay so we take our big moon our big uh death stars sorry to push the metaphor too far and we like try to find the biggest venue we can to land it in but we have to negotiate like hey we'll give it to you you get it free um do right by it really give it some some help um but you can't own it and you can't have it exclusively okay fine you guys you're elite you're david remnick fine you guys get it for two weeks for you know alone but then we are running it in le monde el pais el globo al jazeera all these other places in lots of different languages right and you got to be okay with that okay well that took a huge amount of negotiation and i have a staffer who just does that all the time and she's trying to build our group so that we can run it in gunjur online and we can run it in you know all these tiny places that are out in the world because it's a multilateral uh, approach um that's the death star and then the little orbiting moons we take those out and say hey you know um al jazeera you want this op-ed uh, christian science monitor want this op-ed and we're like hustling constantly trying to get this stuff place why? Because we think of ourselves not as a restaurant where we're trying to get folks to come to us. We're an out service. We deliver, we're Uber Eats, right? We're bringing meals out to whoever might be willing to eat it. Um, and so, and we do the same thing with the doc. We took the doc, we took it to the New York Times. They were like, hey, op-ed, you know, we like it, but we want to open it up and do our own version. Sorry, no, no, no deal. Um, New Yorker, do you want it? Yeah, but we, we kind of want to open it up, do our own thing. Sorry, can't do that. Not going to play ball. Okay, Guardian, do you want it? Yeah, we'll take it. Great. We put it up. We have two Emmy nominations for heading up to New York for them tomorrow. So like, you know, we have good stuff, right? And our instincts are good as a group knowing good stuff. And we hold the line when it's like, hey, look, we think it's really good as it is. It may not be your voice, but it's our voice. And we're not, we can't open the, it's the car as is. Um, then we find big players and then we do the same negotiation. Then we say, okay, Guardian, you can have it. You're alone for 48 hours. And then Global and all these other places get to run it. And so that's sort of how we do it. And we try to place all the little stuff. Yes, our website is a restaurant. It's a tiny little hole in the wall restaurant that no one comes to. You know, like maybe you, you do. And I'm super enamored that you do. But like very few people come to consume our stuff there. But that's where it all lives. But we really try to like get it out in the world in this other way. And a lot of it we haven't even talked about, which is the non-English translation. You know, getting the French and the Arabic translations done and and getting those editors to respond to us. And this is a place where academics could help me because you guys might know. And we work with academic journals abroad, website only abroad, anyone that's willing to put our stuff up. That's not crazy and going to be like, you know, we don't put it on Russian Russia today. You know, we RT, you know, we have some places where we don't uh, play ball. But um, and so that's the decentralized model of distribution. And um, 
you know, it seems to be working. And then we have the whole sort of artistic translation. So three months before publishing, we'll like say, okay, does this lend itself? Pop up magazine, let's put it on stage with them. So we did that. And we've got a couple of musicians that are really gung ho and they want to work with us again. They do great stuff. Let's send them the story now and say, you've got two months to produce a beautiful piece and then hand it back to us and we'll figure out how to pair it with footage, get your approval before we publish. Can you do that? Yes. So we got a techno guy and we got a pianist and we got, you know, all sorts of random stuff and we try to put that all together. Um, and then, you know, we're, there, there are also, and this is not what you asked, but there are things we really want to experiment with. Like, so we have a data, I'm a data geek and we have a huge database of everyone we interact with, readers, subscribers to Substack, editors, et cetera, and a huge number of them outside of US and uh, EU do not do email. They only communicate or primarily communicate with us through WhatsApp. So when Marcella is running all the distribution play, she's got to be talking to those editors through WhatsApp or else they're never going to respond. Okay, well, we're like, okay, we need to start circulating our stories through WhatsApp. So how can we find the technological capabilities? Because we have 10,000 WhatsApp ready consumers who will amplify the stuff in their venue, but they don't pay attention to email. So we got to figure out how to get to them when we're about to go live with the next big thing and get in their WhatsApp. That takes design chops that I don't have, but these are the sorts of things that I could never do at the times, but they also like, if you really want to get folks in these other places, you've got to figure out where they are and how to get them in, in the fashion that they communicate. Thank you so much for, for that actually. And thinking yeah, about, uh, sorry, thinking about distributing WhatsApp um, and how you get it on WhatsApp. Actually, that, that makes a lot of sense to me that you'd have a lot of readers there. Um, I think maybe like my, my last question and uh, to let, wrap it up then is, are there things and uh, that that didn't make it to the restaurant or to or to the Death Star um, okay. that you okay. wish had had made it, um, or that you lament their their sort of loss or absence? Hmm. Yeah, you've raised that, and I and I've been ducking it. Um, let me just think for a second. Um, I mean, I, I the thing I lament the most is with eight of us and only one who's getting on the planes and boats and doing the writing, the, the, the team around me does the reporting and everything in you know, the mural, the music, you know, um, but when it comes to writing and it comes to the reporting, um, uh, it's just me. And, and um, that means I can't maintain um, two things at once. Like I'm all China right now and I've put Lydia away. And when, one of my two open source investigators, Joe Galvin, you know, it's like, hey, did you see what happened in Libya yesterday? I'm like, do not tell me. Like, I do not, I do not want to know because I cannot handle trying to like, because you're going to tell me and then I'm like, well, maybe you can whip out an 800 word story. That's really important. And then I'm starting to creep back into the restaurant business and do daily journalism. And that's not what we should be doing. We're not beat reporters. So we do big things and then we move to the next big thing. So that um, doesn't answer your your question about um i do the one thing i will say is you know some really bad stuff happened to us reporting and i um plan on not letting that go and um we have continued to investigate and just sort of long game very meticulously um reported out the individual people that um did that and um you know, if it takes me five years, um, it takes me five years. We, we've since got the passports of the guys who took us um, and we've been working sort of in a parallel universe on um, something. Is this a story or is this just empowering the FBI and Interpol and the US State Department to do something or is, or is it also a story? I don't know. But I know that none of them are going to do the hard work of the investigation. And so that falls to us. So that is a side thing that I haven't put out there. Um, and I think I'll know when the moment is right. There was one of the two main folks who took us and ordered a lot of shots who was due to come to the U.S. for the U.N. as a security guard. And um, 
uh, we talked with key figures and said, here's his passport. And, you know, um, you might want to think twice about giving that person a visa, because if you do and he's in the UN, I will be writing. Um, uh, so um, that's one thing that I still want to figure out a way to write about, because there were people in that prison across the hall from me that are still there. And maybe they're deserving if there is such a thing, but the notion that we're out and those folks are still there and they don't have the US State Department behind them haunts me. Uh, so I kind of like still uh, am trying to figure out, is there a way to trigger something that brings attention on that secret prison where we were kept? Well, and I want to wrap up then at that at that point with just you know thanks as you saw uh, from um, other colleagues who've posted thanks for this incredible work and um, you know I had wondered just to leave you that I had wondered if you had been afraid to even talk a little bit about what happened to you and your team when you were there and because it it is um, it's such a, a risky and hard work so thank you for doing that work and thank you for joining us here um, and and sharing the ideas and and information and insight you shared with us tonight and um, good luck with the 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 next stages. Well, thank you. It was really nice to be uh, invited. And take care. Take care. And everyone else, maybe see you next week. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.